We're in um, Romans chapter number 5, and we've been coming through this book of Romans, which is a great doctrinal book to the church. And in this book of Romans, what we've discovered so far is that out of love for his creation, for his creatures, you and me, God revealed himself and revealed his truth to us, all the way back from Adam in creation. He personally spoke to Adam. He walked with him in the cool of the garden. And, and the voice of the Lord spoke to Adam. And so God had always revealed himself to mankind. And what he's showing in the book of uh, Romans is that I've come before you. God says, I've come before you. I've revealed myself to you. And there's no excuse for not knowing me. Because even without that first testimony of Adam, we have a conscience in our heart to understand. And God has put eternity in our heart to understand that there's more than what we see around us. And he will reveal himself to each one of us individually. And so he says, there's no excuse for not knowing me. And in chapter 2 of the Bible, he said, not only is there no excuse, but there's no escape from the judgment which is to come. And that's a good thing that he told us about this because, again, it was out of love that he came and he, to tell us um, that it was out of love that, that God so loved the world, it says, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And because of that love, he told us, look, mankind, I've revealed myself to you, but you have a problem. You have a sin problem. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight as we get into this. You have a sin problem. And I can't, and, and there's a judgment coming further. And he said, I can't find you innocent because you're not. I can't acquit you of your crime, your sin, because you're not innocent. But the judge of all mankind, the judge of the earth said, but what I can do is I can send my son to die. And through my son, by faith in the word of God and belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, through him I can justify you. And to justify us is to declare in a moment in time, not a long process, in a moment in time he can justify and say, I see Christ because, I, because you're in Christ. And he can justify us and then declare us just or righteous before him and the penalty for our sins has been taken care of at Calvary. And this is all that he's doing in this great book of Romans. And so this book for us really becomes the full gospel of Jesus Christ. In the first eight chapters, we see the full gospel. We see salvation. We'll see sanctification, our process of walking and being made holy in this life. And then in chapter 8, we'll see our glorification when we receive our new bodies in glory. And then in chapters 9, 10, and 11, just by way of quick review, the Lord is going to turn in this book of Romans, and he's going to say, I want to talk to you about the Jewish people one more time here. I want to give this to you in this great doctrinal book. And he's going to show us the Israel's past in, in Romans chapter 9, a glorious past. Israel's present in chapter 10, their present condition, and that is their one, they're, they're backslidden, if you will. Um, they are, there's blindness in part has fallen upon the Jewish people, by and large, as a nation. And then chapter number 11, he's going to show us, though, their future, which is going to be a glorious future again, when he restores them to the head of nations during that great millennial reign on this earth of Jesus Christ. And that will be their future condition. And then though the Bible in Romans turns one more time in chapter number 12, and it shows us what is the duty of a Christian, first to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 13, what is our duty to the human government which has been established uh, for our benefit? According to the scriptures, he wants it to be for our benefit. And then in chapter number 14, what is our duty to others around us? And then in 15 and 16, you'll finish up continuing to look a little bit at our duties to others and finish it up by signing off, if you will. And so that will be this, um, this, the way this book rolls itself out. And in chapter number 5, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the results of justification now. And justification, again, is that declarative act whereby God says, because you are in Christ by faith, I can declare you just before, before me in judgment day. I can declare you righteous. 
And so we're talking about, though, what are the benefits, if any, of justification today? Because before we get to eternity and glorification, we have to walk this earth. And this earth is a veil of tears. It comes with lots of struggles, lots of troubles. Um, the Bible says that man is born unto trouble as the sparks flyeth upward. And that's true. If you've lived a few years, you know that. And not even sometimes very many years. And you know that. And so what is the benefit of justification today, here, now? And that's what he begins to teach us here in this chapter. And we'll just read through a few verses to uh, get our, you know, by way of uh, reintroducing ourselves to this topic here. Uh, we covered verses 1 through 4 or so, and then we're going to move through this thing. So in this chapter, in verse number 1 of Romans 5, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, that's that, practice, that thing that I just mentioned, where God justifies us in a moment of time because we have received the gospel of Jesus Christ through the word of God. We have peace, he says, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first benefit today is that we are no longer, as it says, look down at verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. See, God has a problem. It's, it's the sin which separates us from him today. And, and the Lord said, look, I can make peace with you now. I want to be at peace with you. And so he does through faith in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He justifies us and gives us peace now with God. God says, I no longer have a declaration of war, if you will, against you. Verse number two, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. What is our benefit today of justification? We have access now into His grace. We also have a standing of grace, meaning standing positionally, we are already seated with Christ in heavenly places because of being placed in Christ, our salvation is secure. But we also have access to that throne of grace, what is it, Hebrews 4.12 is it? I can't remember. Four, no. 4.16. 4.16. Thank you. Hebrews 4.16. Where we, have, we can come to the Lord today in prayer and have access to Him. Those are for His children who by faith have been justified. And it says um, in verse number 3, And not only so, not only do we have peace, not only do we have access into this grace and stand in this grace, but we glory in tribulations also. There is a fruit of tribulation if you're in Christ. And what that fruit is, he's going to identify for us here, but it's a maturing process whereby we can now walk through the troubles in life, not easy, I understand, walk through the troubles in life with a new perspective because the outcome is going to be different. Not everything does work out on this side of eternity for a Christian also. Some things get healed and taken care of on the other side of eternity. But we can have a new perspective because the Lord can mature us and work in us and through us for, the, for the, His glory, for our benefit, and for the benefit of others. As we, as we learn and walk through some of the troubles of life, we are then better able to, with that experience, say to a brother or sister, look, I know what you're going through because I went through it. And let me tell you how the Lord's going to help you. And so we have these benefits to us. And as we look down through this, it says, not only, um, verse 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. And here's some of the fruit of tribulation. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Amen. Yeah, Amen. patience. But we need patience. We need to be able to wait upon the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He shall renew thy strength. He wants, to, he wants us to wait on him with a new perspective. A new attitude. Wait. Patience. And what's the, what's the value of patience? Well, patience, when you wait on the Lord, we gain some experience. Amen. Yeah. Of what? Of the Lord's faithfulness through the troubles and the trials and the tribulations. We learn that the Lord is faithful. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. That's a promise of the scripture. And we learn that when we go through tribulations. And then it says, in patience, experience, and experience, hope. Hope. And experience hope. Hope is an expectation of something which is coming. That's what hope is. And it's not a hope like, gee, I hope it doesn't rain tonight. By the way, if you're hoping that, you're probably going to be... <laughs> 
<laughs> so not a lot of chance of that. But, but it's not that kind of hope. It's an anchor to our soul. That's the kind of hope it is. It's a surety. It's a hope. It's that which gives courage to the inner man. It's that which strengthens the heart because it's sure, this kind of hope, an anchor to our soul. That's like saying, I hope it does rain tonight, right? That's like, yeah, it will rain tonight. You're right. That's like saying, I hope it does because it will. So these are the kinds of benefits that we get. And it says in verse 5, and I think maybe this is where we're picking up, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hope maketh not ashamed. Hope maketh not ashamed. What does that mean? Well, one way it makes not a shame is when we've suffered and we've gone through the trials and we have learned patiently on how to, you know, how to wait on the Lord, uh, we're not going to be ashamed of ourselves. That's one way in which it works itself out. We're not going to be ashamed. Haven't you ever disappointed yourself or your spouse or your, or your son or your daughter or your grandchild or whatever, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, you name it, and you feel sometimes ashamed because you knew you did wrong. You didn't do the right thing. You didn't whatever. And so when we can wait upon the Lord, we don't have to have that shame in ourselves. We don't have to be ashamed because the Lord is, you know, uh, because we've waited upon the Lord. So let's, uh, let's pick up in our, in our text here. Let me uh, turn to my notes now and find out where I'm supposed to be here. Okay, so let's take a look again now, verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The hope that we as believers is because of the love of God. It says, because, let us, and hope making that a shame, semicolon or whatever that thing is, because, because, we're not ashamed and we don't have to be ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The love of God, God's love toward us is shed abroad in our hearts. And then we are in turn, are to do the same. We are to shed abroad or to share the love of, of, of God with other people. As he sheds it abroad in our heart, we're not to keep it in and be like that Dead Sea. We're to give it back out to others and shed that love ab abroad. Look with me, uh, hold your place there, and go a few books over to the right to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians. If you go to Galatians chapter number 5, just... When you get to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, which are two big books, you turn to, you'll get to Galatians, and Galatians chapter number 5. And in Galatians chapter number 5, speaking of the love of God shed abroad in our heart and what the Lord would have us to do with that love, we see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. Pastor Al, can you read that, please? 5.14. Yes, sir. For all the law... Is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And going along with that, I'll just read to you 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Back to Romans. So, as we learn these experiences of life, as we mature and, and, and through the tribulations of life, we are to take that which we learn and we are to, to um, take the love of God and go before others and show them the love of God and show them what we've learned through the trials. 2 Corinthians 1.4, I'll read it, says this, Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Do not waste the tribulations that come in your life. Give them over to God. I know it's not easy. It's not easy in my life. I'll testify. But give them over to the Lord. Wait on Him patiently. Let Him show up and show you what He can do to sustain you through this. That will give you that kind of hope. And that hope, because of the love of God in us, we then can go out and give that love to others. We can show them and share with them the gospel. We can show them and share with them the experiences of our life and how the Lord showed up and did something in our lives. Has he done anything in your life? Amen. 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 
The results of justification now, we're going to move on, were saved from wrath. Saved from wrath. As we examine this next little section of scripture, we'll notice some of the words um, that we'll find here. Look at um, verse number 6 for a second. It says, we were. And I, my own Bible, I circled it. And in verse number uh, 8, it says, we were. And I circled it. In verse number 10, it says, we were. And I circled it. There's some things that we were before Christ. And we're going to see well, those things that we were as we go through the scripture here. And we'll see what we were, but what we are today, and what we shall be in Christ. And so it says here, let's read verse number uh, 6 and 7 and 8. Can I get that back row over here on the left of me to read verse 6? Then Jim 7, then dynamite number 8, if you could. Yeah, go ahead. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. <clears throat> yet for adventure, for a good man, someone even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Don't you want to put a big amen there? <laughs> what we were without Christ, without strength, ungodly, and sinners. How's that? Good way of win friends and influence people? Without strength, ungodly, and verse 8, sinners. This was our legacy before and without Christ. Without strength. That is, we were unable to save ourselves and escape from the wrath of God. In other words, Man cannot save himself. That's the whole purpose of this gospel which he's giving to us. And remember, where he started with the gospel is, I've revealed myself, and you have no excuse, and you have no escape, because you cannot do it by yourself. You are without strength, without the ability to save yourself through your good works. That's what he's getting at here. And it says also, it says that we were ungodly. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Before Christ, if you were not ungodly, that doesn't, you don't fit in there then, do you? He died for me because I was the ungodly man that needed salvation. This is where Christ comes in. He comes in at the ungodly. In his love for us, he died for the ungodly, which means all of us. Before Christ, that's positionally, that's all of us. Now, some of us are more ungodly, if you will, than others. Some of us are just meaner than others. But we're all ungodly before Christ. Positionally, meaning we are not good enough to get to heaven. Some would be willing to give their life to save a good man, right? Some, some people, I mean, some of our soldiers do it all the time. They go and they give their lives, you know, but, but who would give up their life for a scoundrel like you or me? Let me make this real. Back in, uh, what was it, after September, we, you know, I just saw them all the celebration of the memorial going up. After September 11, 2001, who would give their life here tonight to save Osama bin Laden? Christ. Jesus Christ. He died for the ungodly. That's all of us. Osama bin Laden and Ed Luongo. And you can put your name there if you want. So Osama bin Laden can be in heaven right now if he asked for forgiveness before he died? If, if anyone comes to Christ by faith, trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, resurrection, by faith in their heart, acknowledges their own sinful nature before God and says, I have no escape here, or however they say it, but just understanding finally that the Lord Jesus Christ died for their sins. Absolutely. Anybody. Why doesn't Satan do that then? Satan, as far as I know, cannot. He's already been, in one manner, he's already been judged. As far as I understand. But that would be a good topic of study. Notice in verse number 8, it says that, Christ loved us and died for us while we were yet sinners. Now, you know, 
God may love, you know, I, we, we say sometimes God loves this, the sinner, but not the sin. And there's an element of truth to that. There, there really is. I mean, he does love people. He waits for us by his long suffering. He's waiting for sinners to repent. And that motive for that, I believe, is love. That was his motivation for dying. That was his motivation for waiting, is love. But we should not mistake his great love for foolishness. He's not fooled by our sin. He's not fooled by a, by a heart that, that uh, falsely calls upon him, you know, where there's no real repentance, there's no change of heart, there's no, no real acceptance of, their, of your sin and all that stuff. He's not foolish. He knows how to rightly judge these things. That's why we want to be by faith in Jesus Christ. We want to receive that gospel of Jesus Christ. So Christ's love for sinner was, it was openly demonstrated at Calvary, but it didn't end at Calvary. His love didn't end. He's still waiting, 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 waiting for sinners to repent. Whoever they are, whatever they've done. King David, a man after God's own heart who wrote all those wonderful psalms, was a murderer and an adulterer, but he repented of his sin. Moses, the humblest man in the Bible, and who wrote those first five books of the Bible, before he turned his life over to the Lord, I mean, he, in, in anger, murdered. And you and I, in a manner, are guilty of the Lord's death from our own sin, because he would have come into the world to save any one of us, as I understand Scripture. He goes on in verse number 9, 10, and 11. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall, so we've seen what we were, now we're seeing it what we shall, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now receive the atonement. So we see, we, we see in here, we have now, we were, and we shall. In a little bit of a microcosm there, we got our past, present, and future tense of, of, you know, of a Christian. But it says there, be now justified by his blood. Now, we don't have time to study all this out tonight, but I'm just going to give you through a few Bible facts about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56, it testifies of his life-giving power, the blood of Jesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says it testifies to the fact that he is God, is deity. It was God's blood. In Romans chapter 3, 25, which we came through not that long ago, it says that by his blood we have the offer of propitiation or, or that, that payment that God made through faith in his blood. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, what we're just reading here, we have justification through his blood. And in, in Ephesians chapter 1, 7, in Colossians 1, 14, it says we are redeemed by the blood. In yes. Ephesians 2, 13, it says we are made nigh or near unto God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 20 says his blood makes our peace with God. Hebrews 9:12 says by it his blood we have entered into the holy place with God. Hebrews 13:12 says that by his blood he sanctifies us or makes us holy. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 and Revelation 1 verse 5 by his blood he cleanses and washes us from sin. And in Revelation 5:9 and 7:14 it says by his blood again we are redeemed. So we don't have time to go through all that on the blood, but the studying the blood of Jesus Christ is a good study in the scripture. And the interesting thing about that is that the blood of Jesus Christ, the important thing I should say, the blood of Jesus Christ is still sufficient for sin today. It's still good for sin today. For people that you and I know, his blood still has the power to save. That blood that was offered and brought up unto God as a sacrifice to the Father and said, I've paid for the sins of the world. And that's why we've got to get into Christ, by faith. We're made children of God by faith, Galatians tells us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, verse 9, through him. 
We are justified by the grace of God, our faith, uh, um, and by His blood of Christ. We you know these verses here we're looking at. But notice nowhere in this here where it says we're justified by, the, by His grace. That was back in Romans chapter 3. Um, and by our faith, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. And by the blood, verse 9 here. But nowhere does it say anything about being justified by good works, by the observance of holy days, by water baptism. None of those things are present in our salvation. It is only by grace of God through faith and the blood of Jesus Christ being offered freely that we have the opportunity to get saved. Here our text says we shall be saved from wrath. God has not appointed his children unto wrath. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, which Pastor L will be going through here soon, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved, I believe, from the wrath to come during the tribulation, when God's wrath is poured out upon the earth without mixture, because those who are believers in Jesus Christ will be taken up and out of here. Um, and we are also saved ultimately from the wrath of the judgment which sends a man or a woman to hell and to a lake of fire. So because of what the Lord did and because of his blood, we are saved from wrath. Amen. That's a good deal. That's a good thing. What did it cost you? Nothing. 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 It's a good answer. Nothing. Didn't cost you anything. But what did it cost God? His son, his only son, whom he loved. That's what it cost God. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Again, it says we were. We were sinners in need of reconciliation. And in his love, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But what we shall be, much more after our salvation, Christ ever liveth, keeping us safe till glory. He is our high priest today. When the Lord came back, there's three great offices in the scripture. Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. When the Lord came, he was a prophet. That was, that was his office that he uh, held. And, and he even said, a prophet is not without honor except a... Yeah, his own country. He, he came as the prophet. Today he ever liveth making intercession for us. He fulfilling now the office of priest. One day when he comes back, he's going to be Revelation 19, the king, king. of king. kings and lord of lords. And he will fulfill that third office as a king. He will set up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years and he will reign. Who is this king of glory, the psalmist said? The Lord mighty in Glory or strength, I forget. Battle. Battle, there you go. There you go, I might say both. Do you remember where that is, Pastor? Yes. Uh, what is it, Psalm 48? Nope. Psalm 20, uh, uh, I wish I, I didn't write that down. I think it's 24. Who is this King of Glory? Yes, it is, right, of course, 24. Battle, he had it right. Yeah, battle, thank you. Sorry, brother. Sorry, brother. Now you know you know how you should remember Ed. <laughs> you know how you should remember that that it's Psalm 24. He's a king because in Psalm 23 he's the priest, and in Psalm 22 he's the prophet. Go back and just look at those things. I should have remembered that. Thank you for that, though. Okay. So today the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and He's making intercession for us. That's according to to Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Um, we shall make it all the way to glory because of the Lord's past action at Calvary and because of his current intercession for us. He's going to keep us safe. There are so many verses in the scriptures that teach us that he's going to keep us safe all the way. So much so that he says we're, it's like we're already seated in heaven. Before our salvation by faith, the Bible says we were at enmity with God, separated by our sin, but praise God, he's reconciled us and keeps us saved. And that's what he's talking about here. It says, uh, verse 10, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's not that it hasn't happened. He's just saying, no, you're, you're going to be saved. It's going to work out for you if you're in Christ. And not only so, verse 11, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. 
the atonement. The word atonement is found 81 times in the scripture and only one time in the New Testament. Anyone know where that one time in the New Testament is? Romans 5.11. Just wanted to see if anyone was awake. <laughs> <laughs> Romans 5.11, that's right. That's the, there it is. That's the only time that word is found in the New Testament. The atonement in the Old Testament was a payment that the Jews made to God to temporarily cover sins. So it was man coming before God with a sacrifice of a sin offering to make an atonement, temporarily covering the atonement in the New Testament after Christ is now not man coming and making a sacrifice. It's God coming and making the sacrifice of his son. You see the difference? You see why this, this New Testament atonement is so much better? Because it wasn't possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It can only kind of temporarily cover them in an atonement. But today, because of what Christ did, reaching out to us, the atonement coming from God now, not the other way, us making the sacrifice, because we can't save ourselves. We can't do any works to save ourselves. God had to do it, and he offered the sacrifice, the atonement of Jesus Christ. And then we became at one mint. That's a good way of remembering what that word means. We became, if you will, at one with. We became reconciled. You even have part of that word, at, see it, atone, at one, meant. We become at one or become reconciled by God to God. And then that's the ministry that you and I are to take up, remember? The ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. That's what you and I have been given. That's our job as Christians. One of our jobs, an important job, is to bring the, this message of reconciliation. That God has come down to earth and he's made peace through his blood. That's the good news. But isn't it hard sometimes to deliver that? Don't we have, don't we have struggles? It's hard. I mean, you're going through your day, you're busy, busy, running, running, busy, busy. How do you stop and talk to somebody about, well, let me tell you something. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, it's, just, it's not easy, is it? And yet that's our job. Yeah. And he has equipped us to do it. Mm -hmm. The first thing you have to have is a testimony. What's that? Well, testimony. The Lord Jesus Christ saved me. 1972. That's my testimony. That's the first thing that you have to have is a testimony. And if you have a testimony of what the Lord's done in your life, guess what? At the moment, you don't even need a lot of Bible to tell somebody, guess what the Lord did for me? I accepted him by faith and he has given me a, a new home in heaven, a new home in glory. That's a testimony. That's a good thing. And that is what you and I are to do, even without a lot of Bible knowledge. Now, he does want to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, Ephesians chapter 6. He does want us to prepare ourselves with the gospel. But first, we've got to have a testimony. And then we should prepare. We should take a look at this word. We should study this word out and see what do you have to say about this, Lord, so that we are better able to go and talk to others about their need for that same blessed salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay, and now, in chapter number 12, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, in verse number 12, we're going to kind of turn the corner here a little bit. And we're going to see, we're going to start to talk a little bit about sanctification, uh, that there's an indwelling sin, but there's a remedy in the gospel. Um, but we're going to see a comparison made here in a moment between one man and another man. The one man is Adam, and the other man is Jesus Christ. And we're going to see what we have received in Adam, and what we are able to receive in Christ. And we're going to um, uncover here a little bit what would be, would be theologically called a federal headship of Adam. And we'll take a look at that as we go through here. Um, let's turn over to uh, verse number 12. And I'm going to read through a few of these verses just to give us a rolling start. Then we'll go back through and look at them. Wherefore, we're going to see now a comparison of two men. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Parentheses. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, 
even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Paul does indeed write things hard to be understood sometimes, doesn't he? But as we go through, we'll stop there and we'll continue and we'll go through each of those verses. But in these last ten verses of this chapter, Paul's going to turn his attention to describing this contrast between Adam and Jesus Christ. Paul serves up one verse, verse number 12, followed by five verses in parentheses, and then four more to finish up the chapter. The five verses found in the parentheses really draw the distinction for the Jew and their need to be in Christ. So he's going to kind of, by parentheses, he's going to make something applicable to the Jew because he's, he's, he's going to take them to the law on Moses. And that was a really Jewish thing. The Jews really responded to discussions about the law because that's what they knew. And so he's going to put in parentheses here, he's going to emphasize for just a moment to the Jews in those parentheses. But being a Jew is not good enough. They needed, just like you and I as a Gentile needed, Christ just as much as anyone else. God will look at all men the same with respect to their salvation. You are either in Adam, we'll find, or you're in Christ. That's all that matters. In Adam, and we'll see what that means, or in Christ. The contrast between Adam and Christ is highlighted in the following verse from 1 Corinthians 15. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look at one verse. there. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. Who's got that can read it aloud? And loud. Go ahead there, brother. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Hmm, interesting. I've never met Adam. How do I die in Adam? I never met him. We'll talk about it. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Did you ever look at the genealogy of, of Adam? Anybody ever look at that genealogy? Know where it's found? Where's the genealogy of Adam found? Anybody know? Luke. Genealogy of Adam? Well, I guess oh, it would yeah. be. Yeah, no, it would be. Well, but Genesis. Genesis, chapter number 5. Yeah. Did you ever look at that? Take a look at Genesis 5 for a second. The Bible says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We'll uncover this. What does that mean? Take a look at Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter number 5, and verse number 5. 5, 5. That number 5 in your Bible works out, I think, as a dual reference. One to grace and one to death. Yeah, yeah. There's a dual reference there, a dual kind of working of that thing. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Look at verse number 5 in chapter 5. And all the days of Adam lived were 930 years. And what happened to him? He died. And he died. Look at verse number 8 at the end of that. And he died. Look at verse number 11. Here's the genealogy of Adam. Look at verse number 11. And he died. Look at verse number 14. And he died. Look at verse number 17. And he died. Look at verse number 20. And he died. Look at verse 27. Just drop down there. We'll stop. And he died. In Adam all die. Did you ever look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Where is that? In May? You can probably find it in Matthew. Look at Matthew for a second. I don't know where I wanted to turn there, but look at Matthew. Wow. Yeah, Matthew. <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> That's good, but I don't know if it was Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I think it's Matthew. The, the first book of the New Testament. Um, or Luke 3. Or Luke 3. I don't see. I think Matthew chapter 1. For as in Adam all die, we just saw, all died. Look, at, look what it says in chapter 1 of Matthew. First 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Watch this. Abraham begat. Isaac begat. Jacob begat. Judas begat. Pharaoh begat. Esram begat. I don't see anybody dying there. Now, these are just pictures for us. In Adam all die. 
in Christ shall all be made alive. It just isn't it just a beautiful picture that the Bible just shows us. There is genealogy of Adam, all die. In in Christ, all are made alive. Now we're going to take a look at this thing as we study these two reigns of two kings, if you will, King Adam and King Jesus. Adam was given dominion over the earth. Dominion is given to a king. Adam was a king over the earth at one point until he lost it. Jesus Christ is a king. Now we're going to compare and contrast here as we go through back to Romans uh, chapter number 5. And in Romans chapter 5, we're going to see as we work our way through, King Adam, sin enters into the world and death followed in verse 12. King Jesus in verse 15 is a gift of grace and life. In verse number 14, as we'll go through this text, under King Adam, death reigns. In verse 16, under King Jesus, there's the gift of justification. Under King Adam, in verse 15, many die. In verses 17 and 18, under King Jesus, there's the gift of righteousness and life. Under King Adam, in, judge, in, in verses 16 and 18, there's judgment and condemnation. In verse 19, under King Jesus, there's obedience and many made righteous. Under King Adam, in verse 19, there's disobedience and many made sinners. And in verse 21, under King Jesus, we see eternal life. So these are the comparisons and the contrast between Adam, which is going to, and we're going to see here, we're a lot like Adam. So people must choose for themselves, and one by one, whether they will remain in Adam and die, or get in Jesus Christ and live forever. Verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Sin entered into the world of man through Adam's disobedience. He allowed that. I know Eve you know, was, was beguiled by the serpent, but Adam was in charge. He allowed it, and the Bible says that as the leader of that household, he allowed sin to enter in. Adam was not the first to sin, however. Before Adam, Satan, Satan sinned. Satan was, a, uh, uh, Satan was, I guess is, a cherub. He's a created being of God. And it, he said in Ezekiel chapter 28, I think it is, he says he, he was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. And then Isaiah chapter 14, Satan says, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High, and iniquity was found in him. And that happened before Adam sinned. How do I know? Because Satan was the one that brought the temptation. He had already fallen. When that happened, I don't know when that happened, but it was before Adam. So, Satan was the original sinner, as, as, as I understand it, but Adam allowed sin into the world that was then given to mankind, and he's the one that allowed it in. So it didn't originate with him, but he allowed it into the world. King Adam allowed sin into the world that God had created for him, but again, did not originate with him. Death for man also entered into the world by sin. Watch it. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin. The wages of sin is death. That's why people die. Sin. Now we may get cancer and die. We may have a heart attack and die. But we die because of sin. Man was, was created to live forever. There is a curse placed upon the whole world by the action of one man, Adam. He allowed it into the world. He didn't have to, but he did. And because of that, this death passed upon all men, but it says, because all have sinned. So here's the way I would put that thing. If you will, when thinking about sin, we get our wagon from Adam, but we fill it up ourselves with our own sins. Yeah. We get that sin nature from Adam, but we fill it up ourselves. Sin singular may have entered into the world, uh, our world through Adam, but each man sins, plural, on his own. We inherit our fallen nature from Adam, but not his individual sins as we're going to see when we go through here. The doctrine that we receive our sin nature from Adam or through Adam, the sin nature, 
the, 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 the desire to sin, the ability to sin, the, whatever you want to call it, that sin nature, that fallen nature, no longer glorified as a son of God because it's not until we're in Christ are we, do we become sons of God. We're just sons of Adam before that. And in Adam all die. But this doctrine that through Adam we receive the sin nature and death passing upon us before all of sin is called a federal headship of Adam. That's a big theological term. What does it mean? Well, we see an example of it in Hebrews chapter 7, and we won't go there through verses 4 to 10, uh, where it says that, um, Hebrews 7, 9, I'll read it to you. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. What does it mean? Well, Levi was a descendant of Abraham. And he was said to have paid tithes to Melchizedek through the tithes paid many years through Adam. So Abraham, Abraham paid some tithes. Later on, being a descendant of Abraham, it was said of Levi that Levi paid tithes through him, through his federal head, Abraham being the father of the Hebrew nation. So it's that federal headship. When the president or Congress, whoever declares wars these days, uh, when the president of the United States declares a war on a country, we as our Americans are at war. I didn't declare the war, but as, as, as us having a federal headship, I'm now at war. <laughs> because my president, my Congress, declared that there's a war. You see, understand the federal headship? And in Adam, there's this same notion of, of federal headship, meaning that he, if you will, is the father of all, as Eve was the mother of all. Adam, the father of all, I guess. The doesn't, Bible doesn't say it that way, but we receive that sin nature. It's a federal headship issue. So that's what's going on here. So we receive his nature, but we do not receive his sin. We are not born with original sin. That is a Roman Catholic and other probably uh, teaching, doctrine. I do not have an original sin. I have to load that thing up with myself. I have a sin nature. That's important because a, a, a Roman Catholic doctrine would say, and because I've talked to Catholics and I was a Catholic, etc., um, that Christ died to pay for original sin. And so it had to be blotted off my soul. And then after that, I had to do sacraments to keep myself saved, and etc., to pay for those sins. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. We, did, we are not born with original sin. We are born with a sin nature. And then we sin ourselves. And how do we do it? We'll see as we go through here. Verse 13, parentheses. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So, here are the first two of the five verses that are found in the parenthesis. And the Lord's going to speak to all of us, but he's going to speak a little bit to the Jews here because and, and, he's going to remind us about this law in Moses. And I'm going to remind us. <laughs> the law came with Moses around 1491 B.C. And that would, uh, which would take, which would be about 25 years after Adam had lived, give or take a little bit. So Adam had lived, and then the law, Moses. Adam, Moses. So we're talking about that period of time here. He's saying um, that until uh, Moses, there was no law, and yet sin was still in the world. So, what's he talking about here? The fact that sin was in the world from Adam to Moses, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, after Adam, uh, who was the next to sin as we know in Scripture? Somebody, Cain. Cain killed his brother. Wasn't he the son of the, of the wicked one, or...? Yeah, there's some verses. Said that, that Eve was a mother of all, but Cain was of that of that, of that wicked one. Yeah, that's what it says. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that's interesting. It is interesting, but okay, I'm but pass. we're you know, but we're but anybody without Christ and living a certain lifestyle, if you will, whatever you want to call, it, is a children of uh, of pride, etc. Job, and so I know what you're what you're getting at there, but we won't go in. Yeah. We won't dive that deeply tonight. <laughs> I don't want to drown. I've already, there was a lot of rain out there, so I don't, want to, I don't want to go there tonight. Now it says that sin was in the world, but it was not imputed to man until the law. Imputed. Again, that's a good accounting term. We've run into that before. Imputed in this 
nature here means that it was not calculated and charged to someone's account. Now this is an important thing here. The law was a way, if you will, that God could use to measure the transgression and charge it to somebody's account with full knowledge by the individual that they were under a law and sinning. So what he's saying is here is I gave the law and guess what? When I gave that law, now I could charge that to your account. I wasn't charging it to your account. You were guilty, but I wasn't keeping track of it in the same manner. I wasn't showing you that. See, I said don't do that and you did. I said do this and you didn't. Now he's saying the law was given and it was given to, if you will, keep track of that, to show us that, look, see, you can see clearly. I've told you clearly now you're a sinner if you do this or don't do that. So the law was a way God used to measure the transgression and charge it or account it to us with full knowledge by the individual under the law that he was sinning. So once again, we see that the law was never intended to save a man, but rather to show him exactly how much he owed God. The law was now able to show us how far we can fall from him, how far we could fall from his perfect uh, measure that he gave us. Because the law was perfect, the Bible said. And Jesus Christ had to live a perfect life to follow it. So what, I, I think that's what's going on here. But he's saying also that even without the measuring cup of the law, even before the law where he can show this measuring cup, if you will, even before that, without the, imputation, the, the imputing of that sin to a man's account, king death reigned and still reigns today outside of the law. How does king death reign today? Well, he reigns in our hearts of people uh, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Sin, death, brings fear to people who don't know Christ. Death came by man. Death likes all its subjects, not just those who sin after the similitude or similar matter uh, uh, way in which Adam did. We each sin in our own way. That's what's going on. Let's look at the text again. It says, For until the law was in the world, sin was not imputed when there is no law. So God wasn't keeping track against the law. He wasn't saying, here's the measure. But it says, nevertheless, sin reigned from Adam to Moses. Why? Because we are sinners. Even without the measure of the law, we're still sinners. Um, even over to them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So what's he saying? Uh, my sin is not necessarily like Adam's, but it's still sin. I didn't necessarily do the same thing Adam did. It wasn't after the similitude of his transgression. We all sin in our own way, don't we? But it's still sin. And so that's what he's, what he's saying there. At the end of that verse 14, it says, uh, we see a reference to Jesus Christ. It says, Adam being the figure of him that was to come. Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 45, is the last Adam. Adam was a type of Jesus Christ. But here, as we're studying it, by contrast, not by similarity, because in Adam all die. Contrast that to Jesus Christ, all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, I'll read it to you. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Adam allowed sin into the world and death by sin, but Jesus Christ is the righteous and everlasting life. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, made a quickening spirit, is able to make alive or to quicken our dead spirits. That's what is available to us in Christ. So again, that's a little bit hard to get at first, but when all he's saying here, he wants to go back to the Jew who was relying on, on, on the law and their, and their righteousness before the law. And by the way, people do that today. I've talked to people. So you think you're good. Yeah, I keep all the commandments. Really? You do? <laughs> all of them? You love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength, or however it says it there in Exodus? Really? All the time? You do? You keep all the commandments? <laughs> yeah, you didn't have trouble with the first one? <laughs> so what he's saying, but he's talking to the Jew who, who wanted to follow that law, and he's saying, look, even before the law, there was sin. Mm -hmm. The law was just to keep track and to show you just how bad you are. Now you can measure yourself against, against this law and see how many times. It was only the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, the Bible says. So that's what's going on in those verses here. 
Um, and now as we, we kind of work our way through a little bit more, we've got a few more minutes, uh, we'll kind of work through a few verses. We'll, we'll uh, finish up this material here in the parentheses, uh, but we'll see this continuing contrast between death in Adam and life in Christ. Verse 15. Now this one's going to really throw you the way it's structured, the sentence. And we'll do our best with it. But not as the offense, so also as the free gift. That's clear? Is that clear to everybody? Do I have to explain oh, yeah, that? Do we, have to, do we have to talk about that one? <laughs> okay. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, that's an Adam, even more the grace of God, amen, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. One man made all the difference for all men. The one man, Adam, brought sin into the world and death by that sin. The one man, Jesus Christ, brought righteousness and life. The first part of that verse, when you look at that, it almost doesn't seem to make sense because of the way it's written. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. I think what it's saying is that the free gift in Christ is not at all like the offense from Adam, except perhaps that they both that so also came from one man. So what he's saying is, these things aren't alike at all. That's what it's saying. Except so also, except for the fact that they both came by one man. So it's a com comparing or a contrasting of that. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Again, you gotta, you gotta work your way through that one a few times. <laughs> it's not an easy one. But I think that's what it's saying here. Um, he's just saying, look, these things aren't the same. Except they came through one man. One brought death, the other brought life. Now, many are dead because of the offense of Adam, but many have been made alive because of the grace of God and the gift by grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord offers eternal life. I want to look at these few verses. We'll stop then. The Lord offers eternal life to all. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 6. Let's take a look at it. 1 Timothy 2, 6. Let's turn over there. In 1 Timothy 2.6, I guess I should turn there. <clears throat> this this um, gift of by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has, has abounded unto many. So let's talk about that thing, that many for a second. First thing we see in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 6. It says, oops, 1 Timothy 2, 6, I've got to get there. Um, verse 5. Four, well, verse 4. <laughs> uh, how about verse 3? For this is good and acceptable, I'll get it right, yeah. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Who? All men to be saved. That's his desire. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave his ransom, his life a ransom for all. Keep that in mind. Let's look over to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Matthew 20, 28. You mean Calvin was wrong? Well... That's a long conversation. Yeah, sorry that. That's right. Uh, as I see it, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my. It, it's kind of like this. Here, here's how I how I see that. Here's how I see uh, um, um, Calvin and, and and the idea. The idea in Calvin, if I understand his teaching, is that um, before the foundation of the world, God chose some to be saved and some to go to hell. That's the idea of Calvin. And, and, that, and that is the elect. They were called the elect. There is such a thing in the Bible as the elect. Mm -hmm. The elect, however, is always according to foreknowledge, 1 Peter. According to foreknowledge is the elect. So here's, here's how it goes, as I understand it. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, 2, or 3, right in there, Jesus Christ, the first time that word elect shows up, it's a reference to Jesus Christ. He is the elect. 
as we get in Christ, that's why I often say that that term, that phrase, in, 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 is so important. Because as we get in Christ, we are now part of the elect because Christ was elect. First time that thing shows up in your Bible, elect, is right there and it's Jesus Christ. And when we get in Him, we are now the elect. And it's according to God's foreknowledge. That's how I see it. Now, there's a lot more that can go with it, but that's how I see that, that whole thing that you uh, brought up there. It's according to his foreknowledge, but, but whosoever will may come. And if you ever want to study that, just go look at the whosoever verses in the Scripture. But now, take a look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. We'll finish with these couple of verses. And we're going to go to Isaiah 53. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many... But I just read in verse, uh, 1 Timothy 2.6, it says, who gave himself a ransom for all. Mm -hmm. He did. And many will receive him. That's what it's saying. It is, it, 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 it's all, it's many, but it turns out it was all. He gave his life a ransom for all, and many will receive him, but many won't. But many will. I'll read he, uh, Isaiah 53.11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be justified by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. But God so loved the world that whosoever. So the many of our, of our verse number 15, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. It's many because some will not receive. But his desire is for all. He gave his life a ransom for all, and many will receive, but many, unfortunately, will reject. And again, that's where you and I come in. That's part of what we have. We have a gospel, a message of reconciliation. As difficult as that can be for us sometimes, if it isn't delivered by the Christian, who's going to deliver it? Sorry. Who's going to deliver it to, you know, I mean, all other doctrinal stuff aside, whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, this, that, or the other thing, who's going to deliver that message if it isn't us? Who has the words of eternal life if not us? We do. We do. That's why it's so important. I mean, you can talk about this doctrine and that doctrine, and it's good because we are to study doctrine. We are to rightly divide the word of truth to the best we can. But we still see through a glass darkly, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us. But one thing, if nothing else, as Christians, let's get a hold of the gospel. That Christ came to, 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 to die for sinners, to save sinners. That's the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we have to deliver. That's the good news that we have to offer to people. Nothing else. What else do any one of us have to say? How's the weather? How are the bills doing? How are the whoever's playing today doing? I mean, what else have we got to say to people? But we have the most important message, and we just have to find ways to get it to people. Yes. Yes, anyway, you got a testimony? You got a good start. That's right. All right, Pastor Al, we'll finish, uh, Lord willing, we'll finish with that next week. Okay. I don't know how to turn myself off. <laughs> <laughs> that one I can get. <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. There you go.